Chippewa Falls, a little town in Wisconsin, was the birthplace of Mark L. Prophet. Born on Christmas Eve in 1918, he was the only child of Thomas and Mabel Prophet. Mark grew up in this little house with his mom during the Great Depression. They lived alone here after Mark's father died when he was only nine years old. This affected him deeply. As a young man, he had the burden of helping to meet his family's financial needs. But you know, I'll always remember Mark not only as a great teacher and a messenger, but as a down-home kind of guy. He'd be your best buddy. He'd joke with you. He'd be your friend. Mark was one of the most fun-loving and spontaneous people I have ever known. As a child, his mystical inclinations were apparent. He saw and freely communed with angels and nature spirits. When he had these experiences, he told his mother, whom he loved so much, but she couldn't quite understand. A very religious person herself, she played the organ at a little country church. She knew that Mark had an extraordinary devotion to God, and this made her very happy. Mark attended the Pentecostal church and prayed by the hour at this altar that he built in the attic of his home. Before finishing high school, he had received all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. When Mark was 18 years old and working for the railroad, El Moria appeared to him. Mark was hard at work driving railroad spikes, putting his whole body into it. In one incredible moment, the master El Moria suspended the laws of time and space to appear to Mark and tell him of his mission. The vision seemed to last five minutes, but the master had compressed it all into a single stroke of Mark's sledgehammer. The next day, Mark received a telegram from Western Union confirming his experience and what Moria had told him. Unable to reconcile the turbaned Eastern adept with his lifelong devotion to Jesus, Mark dismissed him for a time. It wasn't until years later that El Moria returned and Mark accepted him as his teacher. Under his direction, Mark went to Washington, D.C. and founded the Summit Lighthouse for the purpose of publishing the teachings of the Ascended Masters. Mark met his twin flame, Elizabeth, in 1961, and together they had four beautiful children whom they loved very much. Mark and mother took a special interest in teaching their children at a very early age. Mark loved to have Sean meet various people and recite what he'd learned, such as the table of chemical elements or the Greek alphabet. It's funny how some people would criticize Mark for combining elements of everyday life with his ministry, for having children, for what he ate, or even for owning a CB radio. Mark was very refined and very sensitive, but he could also jump into the role of either playing the fool or playing the simpleton. He would do all sorts of things that were definitely unexpected in the face of individuals who normally expected to be received with the greatest pomp and flattery. Mark traveled with his family and several devoted students to Europe in 1968. We sailed on the SS Bremen from New York City to Bremerhaven, Germany. Mark was constantly traveling to do his work, to open the way for the light bearers who could not come into the teachings because of karmic records in their nations and in their auras. This particular trip to Europe was for the clearing of the records of witchcraft, the various records that were causing the elements to shake, and for the cutting free of the souls of light in Europe. Mark drove us into Germany in the Rhine Valley. He remembered this area from when he was Longfellow, so he was able to find the streets wherever he went. The local people couldn't understand how he could locate places the way he did. From this vantage point, we see the Rhine River, and up in the etheric, we have Lanello's retreat. You can call to the angels to take you to Lanello's chateau on the Rhine. At this retreat, you may be invited to the library of scrolls, which contains diagrams of new age cities, works of art, and inventions greater than we would dream possible. Or kneel at a special fountain and let Lanello sprinkle you with its holy water that's blessed daily by angels. Mark loved to drive. He always got the feeling when you were driving with him that not only was he scanning the physical octave in all directions, but was also reading the Akashic records of the landscapes which he would comment on and he could carry on a personal conversation, uh, talk on the phone or two-way radio, and expound on his latest insights from the Ascended Masters. On one such journey when I was with him, he dictated without a hitch or hesitation his entire poem entitled, Tell Them. Santa Barbara, California was the birthplace of Summit University. 
The Mother House was purchased in 1969 to fulfill Mark's vision for a New Age mystery school for the raising up of Chilas of the Great White Brotherhood. The first session of Summit University, then called Ascended Master University, was conducted by Mark himself for two weeks during the summer of 1971. It took about a year after its purchase to renovate the Mother House, and on the occasion of its completion, the ladies donned their saris and we left from Santa Barbara for a pilgrimage to the sacred shrines of India. The Taj Mahal. In his final embodiment of Shah Jahan, Kathumi built this architectural wonder as a tomb for his beloved wife, Mumat's Mahal. It symbolizes the mother principle and is the shrine of his eternal love for his twin flame. Mark's purpose in journeying to India was to bring light to the subcontinent, not the reverse. The masters had warned of the great dangers that world communism was posing in India. Unfortunately, we have seen a partial fulfillment of their worst prophecies. In their travels, the messengers tried to spread their message to world leaders wherever they could. In this case, Indira Gandhi, then Prime Minister of India, was given some recordings of teachings by the messengers. It's too bad she and other world leaders didn't accept the anointed messengers of the Great White Brotherhood. After seeing Mrs. Gandhi, they were granted an audience with a Dalai Lama. We can only show you the outside of his headquarters because pictures weren't allowed inside. In Kashmir, you'll see some of the most beautiful terrain in India. Right above this mountain and in this area is the location of Kathumi's etheric retreat, the Temple of Illumination. Kathumi is hierarch of the Brothers of the Golden Robe, and from his focus at Shigasi, Tibet, the master plays sacred classical music of East and West and compositions of the heavenly hosts on an organ keyed to the music of the spheres. With this celestial music, he draws souls who are in transition out of the astral plane and into the etheric retreats of the Great White Brotherhood. India, a land of great contrasts, of intense overcrowding and poverty, yet a land of great beauty and spirituality. The India pilgrimage was one of the most physically exhausting but spiritually important trips made by the messengers. These were very quaint times, very intimate times. It's like we all lived in the bosom of Abraham. It was just like we lived inside of Mark he was our life, all of our living, and he represented the masters to us. None of us could really know who El Moria or Saint Germain of the Elohim or the Archangels were, except when we were in the presence of Mark and we heard them speak. We felt their vibration, their energy, and received their teaching. We were always grateful to him for reacquainting our souls to those inner teachings which have been guarded in the mystery schools since the last days of Lemuria and Atlantis. In his humility, he walked the path for all of us to follow in his footsteps. Ah, the beginnings of the gold bus. For a long time, Mark traveled in conventional motorhomes but one after another gave up the ghost because of the long miles and shoddy construction. So Mark decided to buy this old Continental Trailways bus and build it from the inside out. On the road, Mark did almost all of the driving. He was at home behind the wheel of that bus. After Mark's ascension, this gold bus was used by mother to travel and preach in nearly every city across America. The Mealy Press arrived in the middle of winter. And again, Mark was working with the elementals and told all of us who were building the shop to house the press that we had to hurry up because he was holding the snow back. The Broadmoor Ski Resort was very upset that winter because, mysteriously, there wasn't any snow. Mark told us, I can't do this forever. So the day the last shingle was put on the roof of the shop, the snow came down. Mark called the print shop the manger because it's the place where birth is given to the logos as the word is put into print. Of course, it was a grand and proud moment for all of us when the press was carefully put into place. This was the press that was used to print Climb the Highest Mountain. 
I remember Mark taking great joy in examining every page of that book as it was prepared for printing. The Four Winds Organic Center was the crystallization of one of Mark's greatest dreams. He was there almost every day. He met and talked to people. Many Keepers of the Flame were contacted through his presence. His vision was to see the Four Winds in every city across America as a place where people could find their spirituality by purifying their bodies with whole foods. Egypt, the land of Serapis Bay. The Great Pyramid and the Sphinx are a familiar sight to all who visit Egypt. The Sphinx symbolizes the repository of the great mysteries of the ages. Both the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid are believed to have been built to preserve the knowledge brought from Atlantis to Egypt. The Great Pyramid represents a tremendous feat of engineering unparalleled even today. It is considered, among other things, an instrument of precise knowledge in the sciences of geometry, astronomy, and geography, and most importantly, a guide to the path of initiation. The ascension is the culmination of millions of right decisions in many lifetimes. One of those lifetimes of Mark was as the Pharaoh Ikhanaten. At the same time, Mother was embodied as Nefertiti, his wife. Ikhanaten was a courageous innovator who abandoned the pagan gods of ancient Egypt in their human and animal forms. He substituted for them a doctrine of monotheism centered around a universal god, the sun god Aton. Ikhanaten, a true individual the most remarkable of all pharaohs, the first prophet of history. This bust of Ikhanaten was done in compliance with his orders that he be shown in complete fidelity to his unusual anatomy. This was in stark contrast to previous pharaohs who were depicted as godlike. He insisted on truth in art, and this image of Nefertiti is another beautiful example of the artist's new freedom. The Nile River is the lifeline of Egypt. It's linked to every part of Egyptian society and culture. The annual flooding of the Nile accounts for Egypt's fertility. <laughs> but it's funny how the people year in and year out build their houses right on the banks of the river. They do this with full knowledge they will be flooded out each year. Everybody liked to dress up in these headdresses, <laughs> especially Mark. But when you put on a headdress, it makes you look like you're immediately a native. When we were on this boat trip, the guide told us the story of how Moses was placed in the Nile and how the Pharaoh's daughter found him in a certain place along the river. <laughs> then he pointed over to the bulrushes and he said, there they are, that's where they found him. We traveled by bus all over the Holy Land, and we always made sure that there was an accordion nearby so that we could hear and sing our songs. I'm sure the bus driver was impressed that we sang everywhere we went. Coptic Church Cairo. Mother Mary had been there with Jesus and Joseph on their flight to Egypt. In our time, Mother Mary appeared here for many months, and it is one of the most sacred shrines in Egypt. Unfortunately, the media suppressed those appearances. This is the Valley of Megiddo. It is said that the Battle of Armageddon will be fought here, that final great struggle between the forces of good and evil. You can see the valley in the background right behind Mark. Mother and Tanya are in front of the home of Martha and Lazarus. As Martha, in one of her past embodiments, Mother witnessed Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. This is the location in the Essene community where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. 
Mark told us that the angels who had inspired the Essenes had also inspired Mark and Mother in the writing of Climb the Highest Mountain. We visited one of the many shrines that marked the place of the resurrection. There were a number of locations thought to be the historical tomb of Christ. Jesus told Mark that the physical location was not of great significance because the event is contained in the Akashic records and can be contacted through inner attunement. In Colorado Springs, Colorado, our focus was called the Retreat of the Resurrection Spiral. Also known as La Terrell, it is one of the most beautiful settings you could ever imagine. We always look forward with great pleasure to the arrival of students for a conference and to Mark's opening day address. You would find his lectures full of every kind of joke and story you could imagine. Yet they were filled with great cosmic insights. Let's listen to the master storyteller tell the story about the man, his son, and the donkey. It's like the old story of the man who was crossing the bridge, and he had a donkey, and uh, he had a little young son. And so they were both leading the donkey along, and the gentleman came along, and he said, how very, very foolish. Why in the world are you both walking when the donkey is well able to carry you both? Well, he thought he would try it himself because he was older than the son. So he got on first and then the son led the donkey and someone came along and they said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, old man. There you are, riding that donkey. Why don't you let your little son get on? So he put his son on. Another man came along and he said, why this is ridiculous. He said, that donkey's able to carry you both. Second time, so. They both hopped on the donkey. The donkey went across another bridge, and then they were coming to another bridge, and a man came along and he said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, both of you riding that poor donkey. Why don't you carry the donkey? <laughs> so they whittled a pole out and leather thongs, and they tipped the donkey upside down, and they carried him over the stream, and the thongs broke right in the middle, and down he went into the stream, and that's all, and that's exactly what happened. Because human opinions would drive us half crazy if we let ourselves. And we never understand the truth because the truth is so simple. Mark was so personal and he just loved to talk to people. One of his favorite things to do on the last day of a class was to have people stand up and say who they were where they were from and what they did. His ear was always ready to hear and be compassionate whenever you needed him. His character was that of a man of great courage for his convictions. His steadfastness and loyalty to the masters was unswerving. He had a loving nature with a great ability for forgiveness. His childlike faith and humble attitude were so often expressed with the strength of a lion. George Lancaster, who has since made his ascension, is walking here towards the camera. He's wearing the white shirt with a black bow tie. Hello, Uncle George. We had to freeze all kinds of fruit for this picnic while young Alexander Reichardt and Monroe Shearer worked hard to blend the fruit into a type of ice cream.
we have our beloved Ruth Jones. Uh, excuse me, the Ascended Lady Master Ruth Jones. She was with Mark and Mother for many years before taking her final victory in the Ascension. Beloved friends of freedom, children of the sun, I come to you tonight with the flame of freedom blazing fully upon the altar of my own heart so that I may kindle upon the altar of your heart the self-same God-identifying factor of electronic light essence that blazes upon the altar of my being. I am charged with this essence. I am manifesting this essence. I am this essence of cosmic and universal reality. When all of you concentrate together then upon the sacred force field or chakra of the heart, it will help 
to produce a manifestation of God awareness which is the fullness of the cosmic intent for every man-child upon this planet and upon all planets in all systems of worlds. For there is a universal drama being enacted everywhere, and this drama is filled with the poignant manifestation of the love of God. This is a love of innocence, a love of purity, and a love of wholeness that enables the identity of man to become clothed upon with the majesty of the eternal robe of man's universal identity. Down through the ages, lesser images have formulated themselves in mortal consciousness and have caused individuals to constantly fear that they were falling short of the glory of God. Yet such was never the idea of the Eternal One. For your own beloved, mighty God Presence, your God Presence, I Am, has ever held for you an inviolate image of cosmic light, which he has charged for through all density of mortal creation and has sought to bring you one and all into the family of universal identity where you could then bask in the sunlight of your own flame of reality a very important part of yourself, I am sure, but one that is far too frequently neglected because individuals are often caught up in the strange miasma of the shadow self and do not understand the nature of the great blazing body of light substance that constitutes the real being of man. The real being of man is a configuration of such dazzling reality as to absolutely cause the soldiers guarding the tomb of the resurrected Christ to fall to their knees, to be blinded, to be unable to see the light of day for some time because of the effulgent out pouring of light substance through his resurrected body. Consider then the potential of your own individual identity when you are able to grasp that principle of cosmic universal buoyancy that will bring you a feeling and release from all identification whatsoever with mortal substance that will give you for all time a cosmic universal sense of the fire of the heart for the heart of man which has been referenced 
as being deceitfully wicked, he is also a chalice of such exquisite beauty when it is filled with the manifestation of the eternal intent that man can scarcely realize the former state from the latter. When he comes to that beautiful position in cosmic reality where the sun of the eternal presence manifests the fullness of all that each man is. Will you then tonight, while I'm speaking to you, concentrate upon the heart center of your being? Will you for a moment forget your so-called native identity, identifying with this particular embodiment in time and space? And will you come apart from all identification with such conditions as those that are often unreal and enter into the great blazing reality of that sun center of self anchored within the fourth field of your beating glorious heart of light. Will you tonight then understand with me that when you enter into that heart of light, when you commune with that eternal presence that is actually pulsing moment by moment the flames of universal reality into the very cosmic force field of real identity, you can find at last that you are not a physical body at all, but a real person, a soul identifying both now and always with God, with the power of God, with the love of God, and with the flame of freedom that God is. When that flame of freedom breathes and lives within your soul, the paltry treasures of mortal self become as nothing and man sees that he has been as a surf groveling in the sands and dust of the earth without ever understanding the meaning of his immortal destiny. For destiny comes to man when he is able to yield at last that sovereign free will that he has treasured so often and so frequently, but has not really understood. For alas, down through the pageant of the ages that constitutes life upon earth, an individual life for each man, he has played his many parts, identifying with the gross as well as the ethereal. He has felt that each identification during the time of its enactment was a ritual of reality. 
but he had seldom understood that it had no part with the reality of God unless it identified with the reality of God. For we are now not speaking about temporal things, about the passing scene, but we are talking about the eternal verities of God that actually create the fires of the mind that endow mankind with a sense of compassion for his fellow men, that enable him to evaluate life properly and to esteem the virtues of freedom for himself and all humanity. Think you then that the conditions manifesting upon this planet today are the will of the eternal? Think you that God desires to create worms? That God desires to create animals to tear and destroy one another viciously? Think you that God favors war and deceit and false judgment. Certainly this is not the activity of the eternal, but it is the activity that mankind has engaged in through the centuries, which is the compounding of that which individuals call history. We often say amongst ourselves in sort of an odd joke, perhaps to you, this is not history, but a hissing of serpents. And truly it is so. For mankind today do not understand or grasp the sacred power that is descending upon them and sustaining their physical breath and existence. They do not understand that that physical breath and existence was given to them solely in order that they might attain to a sense of eternal values, that they might resurrect in themselves the glory of God which they had with him before the world existed, before form and form consciousness manifested. Let me then say to each and every one of you that I am come tonight together with the Lord Christ and others of the ascended host in order to start this series of meetings out in what we consider the right manner to resurrect within you a new sense about the inward identity which many of you, in fact most of you, have identified with at one time or another, but which you have simply not identified with frequently enough. Let me then hasten to assure you that our love for you today is as always a glowing coal from the altar of heaven, that we esteem every action most fondly that men do in freedom's name, that we also, by counterpoint, do deplore every action 
which mankind engage in that brings about destructive circumstances in the world and creates feelings of oppression or fear. For God has not desired that the sweet planet should be a planet of fear fraught with constant peril. It is his will to create a spirit of love such as the world has never seen manifest in themselves. Individuals may say, is not the spirit of love already created? And to them we respond saying, yes, it was created in the beginning, but men have not appropriated it, and the eternal creation that has stood ready to transmit itself to them in all the fullness of its God identity has remained aloof from them because they have remained aloof from it. And the beauties of heaven, the beauties of the glowing freedom of cosmic fires are scarcely known to mankind today so that many of them are caught up in the very marvelous stories of those who are not a part of the Christian movement as such but who live in the far distant Himalayan mountains and there through attunement with God are able to manifest many of the powers which mankind in Western civilization do not yet have. May I say to you tonight then, in God's name, that this is somewhat a travesty on opportunity. For to Western civilization was given the great motivating power of science. We have endowed mankind here in the West with the power and industry to create great cities and temples, to create halls of learning, to utilize electronic miracles to spread abroad the word. But where is the word sustained? The word is sustained in the within, in man. And there are those who sit in meditation in the Far East who attain to contact with this lost word, with the spirit of the lost word, with the building of the eternal pyramid within. They understand the meaning of compounding life toward infinite purposes. They understand the meaning of eternal progression, of the order of the angels, of the order of men, of the order of the gods. They understand that the endowing power was vested of old in the Hierophants, and that to these elect of God, such as Melchizedek, priest of Salem, was given the power to vest the disciple with the virtues of his own dazzling reality, to resurrect and awaken within him the sacred fires of the Spirit, that he might be able to communicate with his God in those realities that would forever put to shame outer manifestation with its vacancy, 
with its sham, with its fraud, with its deceit, with its pains and attendant warfare between hearts. We speak then to all of you tonight in the name of the love of God, in the name of the love of his sacred fire, in the name of cosmic universality, and we say, let the flowers of the Spirit blossom in the garden of your heart. Let the meaning of freedom come into renewed focus tonight. Let the purity and sunlight of the eternal presence blaze within the force field of yourself. Put aside your toys of hate and deceit, your toys of miserable nonsense, and hear now the resurrecting beat from higher octaves of light that signifies to all mankind no need to be defeated by mortal might and buffoonery. For we are come to resurrect within you a new sense of cosmic awareness, the flooding power of the light and love of God we are come to flood forth to you all tonight the purity of his intent. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Understand then that each of you and every precious soul that God did ever form was, as you would say, in jeweler's art, 24 carat pure in its intent. God created men with the inward implanting of the cosmic seed that was intended to dispense to them throughout the entire period of their nativity and identification through their novitiate, through their upbuilding and up to their mastery the full reality of the blazing purposes of life, that they might not be lost in the wilderness of self and find there that they thirst for the waters of immortal reality. We say to you then, O oh, everyone that thirsteth, come and drink. Come and buy wine and oil. Come and partake of the fountain of that reality that is within. And let your hearts be still from fear. There is no need to fear. In the stillness 
of the radiance of cosmic purpose within the domain of your own internal destiny, there is in the eyes and intent of God the plan to keep you in the spirit of the Christ alive forevermore. God has no intent to let the flame that lives in you now die. Not only not now, but never. For he will not leave you in despair or comfortless. He will bring to you the radiant reality of himself. He will infuse this generation who will respond to him with the power of his love that will forever blaze forth into the world as daring achievement, as courage to do the right, as a sense of reality, as a sense of dazzling white raiment to be worn. The understanding then refreshed the washing of this holy morn, stretching out to purify the world will be a cleansing to the entire world. And this cleansing will be in the holy name of freedom, we would make of the family of nations a harmonized mode, a harmonized congregation, a harmonization of heart. For then all pain and sense of struggle will cease and you can teach one another the divine arts, the divine graces, and the face of cosmic universal good fortune will smile upon you with renewed impact the glowing sun the sacred fire of that reality will touch your soul will infuse your mind will sanctify anew a perfect generation in the never failing light of God. And so I say to you in freedom's name, be not afraid. For the mustering power The power of intensification of the flame of purpose is within you. Activate it. Demand it. Call it forth from life. Invoke it. Refuse to remain glued to your seats, a part of a vain generation whose name is vanity, 
instead sees the burning brand that is held within the cup and torch and release thy being from fear and unbelief for reality is born within the reality that is the faith of eternal achievement. Draw nigh then unto the heart of your presence now. And let the glowing fire that burns upon the altar of being rise and be repulsed again and again by cosmic energy. Let that energy flow over the lip of the cup and let it make of all of you the many one. Let it flow out into the world with fiery intensity. Let it hoist the banner of freedom high from every public building, from every tree, from the air that breathes the spirit of freedom. Let men learn once again to say, I am free, and to mean it. Let men learn once again to say, I am clean, and be it. Let men learn once again to say, I love, and mean it. Let men learn once again to say, I am one with thee, my Father, and see that it happens because they want it to. Let all generations call him blessed. Let the powers of the Christ multiply within the heads, the hands, and the consecrated hearts that are the chilas who in this day shall not fail to exert those required efforts that will bring about a renewal of momentums upon the planetary body that will cause the congregation of the great white brotherhood to once again be convoked at will and to see to it that we once again can stand as directors of men and women who will understand the meaning of travail for a purpose. When this is done, I say to you that nothing shall stop this generation from moving forward to their divine destiny and finding at last the secrets of the ages concealed 
within the vital essence of the flames, within the point of contact in their own heart. I, Sanctus Germanus, Holy Brother of the Light, in the year of our Lord, 1969, surrounded by the perils of men, say, the torch blazes on. The torch shall not go out. The torch shall live in you. I decree it so in the name of God. I am. Parting, let us hear some words from Longfellow's poem, A Song of Life. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Thus thou art to dust, returnest was not spoken of the soul. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime, and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. the 
flame. I am Lanello within you. I am the course that you will not run in vain. I am the course of victory. throbbing as your heartbeat coursing through your veins I am the victory the overcoming I am the oneness of the light that overcomes that duality of the night driving in his sob. So it's, it's not the perfect uh, thing for this New York stage, but it's very dear to our hearts. Oh 
Thy love. 
Let us sing now to the fiery destiny of the threefold flame of the heart becoming the living sun of Helios and Vesta. Out of the one flame comes the twin flames of eternal love of Alpha and Omega of the twin causal bodies of you and your beloved twin flame. We sing the song of the new day. We sing to Helios and Vesta, and as we send them our love, on the return current there is the descent of that Son of God in our hearts to expand the sacred fire that is for the holding of the balance, for the dispensation of the great divine director. Here on the 10 o'clock line of the day, we keep the flame of the priests and priestesses of Lemuria, of the sacred fire that fulfills all of the law below as above.
The Excelsior Recording.